Ken Chumley. I, I, just, you know, <laughs> I just stopped right there. Well, I did, in, in perusing his uh, biographical information here, I see that, uh, and, and already knew that he was a, an Englishman, and uh, I, I couldn't help but think earlier when the comment was made during Johnny's lesson about us, uh, what, 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 what is the saying, we're, we're sister countries separated by a common language? <laughs> a common language? Yeah, okay. And then I see some time in Australia. And uh, what really piqued my interest, though, is that he met his wife, his wife uh, Linda, in Texas. So you got off to a good start, huh? All right, all right. Uh, they have three children, Stephen, Thomas, and, and Ellen, and uh, how many grandchildren now? Six. Six. On the way. And another one on the way. Okay, well, you got some catching up to do to David, David. Yeah. Way ahead, so you got to, got to hurry. He's preached the gospel all over the world, uh, and currently he is uh, with the Belvedere Church of Christ in South Carolina. And uh, I won't take up any more of his time, so Ken, come speak to us, would you? Well, I just want to say a couple of things before I actually start my lesson this morning. You got to start me anyway. Well, that's... So be it. But just real quickly, I uh, got a telephone call a number of years ago back in the uh, early 80s. We were just at the supper table and Grace Carragher got on the phone and said that uh, Frank wanted to talk to me. So I said, where? At the house or the church building? And they said the church building. Well, I understood why soon after we got to the church building. Frank knew the truth. He'd been out on his tractor during the day and they finally struck home with him that he needed to obey that truth. And I had the privilege of baptizing him into Christ back then, and it's been a privilege and a pleasure to watch him grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. The other thing I want to say before I start is to thank everyone, both those who are here and some who will be listening via the uh, internet and other means for all of the prayers that have been offered during the time of my difficulties with my surgery for the help that has been given in so many ways and encouragement that has been received. Some of it of a very amusing nature, but it's been good. And I just want to thank everyone for that, and I'd ask particularly that you keep my wife Linda in your prayers. She came to realize that, that she was diagnosed with CLL, which is the good kind of leukemia. that keeps her very tired, and she's still battling on teaching school to help us financially and with our health insurance. So she really needs continual prayers as well, and I'd appreciate your help in this regard. But now, lest I get uh, locked off at the end, let's begin with our lesson this morning. In the long ago, the prophet Hosea said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. My people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. Such is the situation today as it was in the days of Hosea. My topic is an informed membership and unity. And the title suggests that there's a relationship between unity and a membership in the Lord's church that is informed with regards to matters that either enhance unity or are divisive in their very nature. And we want to develop this topic this morning by learning a number of matters that relate to it. And in so doing, show that in order for there to be unity among the people of God that our Savior prayed for in John 17, Christians are to be a people that are informed. And being informed involves not only a knowledge of the Word of God, but also being informed regarding false teachers and false teaching that would disturb that unity. Briefly, the necessity of Bible knowledge, we've noted Hosea 4 and verse 6, and that would need is sufficient in itself, but there are other passages that we need to look at. Hosea 6 and 6, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of the God more than burnt offerings. And here we see that God, through the prophet, tells his people, for our worship 
to be acceptable, it must come as a result of our knowledge of God and his will, and that thus should encourage Christians to study the word of God at every opportunity, both with others and in personal study. Paul expressed to Timothy the need for study in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must have knowledge in order to be able to rightly divide God's word. And then he said, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It takes study of God's word and knowledge of God's word so that we can know true doctrine, that we can be reproved when necessary and find correction and be instructed in righteousness. And again in Romans 15 and 4, Paul wrote, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And we notice he wrote to the Corinthian brethren. He showed the reason why these things were written for our learning and how essential it is for our knowledge to have an understanding of the Old Testament so that we can learn from the examples both good and bad in order to, be able to live in harmony with God's will. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Right into the Colossian brethren. Colossians 1, 9 and 10, he says that brethren were to be filled with knowledge and that they might be increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. Peter encourages brethren that they may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 verse 18. And when exhorting brethren to give diligence to add those seven things to their faith, one of those things to be added is knowledge in order that they might be not barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, verse 5 and 8. And Paul also expressed his concern for the children of Israel, that they might be saved. Why? Because they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10 and 2. Yes, there are many today who have a zeal, but lack knowledge even among those who are members of the body of Christ. It's no wonder that both Paul and Peter were desirous of all being knowledgeable of God and his will, for it to be is God's desire also. And thus Paul exhorting the brethren to pray for all men and for those in authority. He said, 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, what about the church's responsibility in propagating knowledge? Well, our Lord was here upon earth. He promised to build his church, Matthew 16, verse 18. That church, that church alone was that which was purchased with his blood that was shed on Calvary's cross, Acts 20, and verse 28. Our Lord kept his promise. And that church was established on that first Pentecost following his death, burial, and resurrection when those who responded to the gospel of Christ were added to the church. Acts 2 and verse 47. Paul, in writing to his son in the gospel, he wrote in 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. To the church at Ephesus, he wrote, Ephesians 3, verse 10, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Is it any wonder then when our Lord gave that great commission to those who would be the members of his church, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, it is clearly the church's responsibility to uphold the truth. And thus it is the responsibility of the church to propagate the knowledge of that truth in order that men and women and young people are God to know the truth, the truth that is able to set them free. John 8 and verse 32. Clearly, if the church is to fulfill its responsibility, it must be informed. It must have knowledge. 
If it is to preach, teach, and uphold the truth of God's word, those who teach, those who preach, must know God's word, know the truth. They can set people free. So we have, as a church, that responsibility, but how does the church fulfill that responsibility? Through the individual members of the church. That means all of us have a responsibility to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the truth of God. And as Brother Fag told me just a few minutes ago, that if you don't grow, something's wrong. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. I want to read just briefly from the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through chapter 6 and verse 3. When there is very clear the relationship that exists between knowledge and, and unity. He says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And it becomes such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. The writer clearly indicates that a lack of knowledge prevents some from becoming teachers of the Word, and as a result of being unable to discern the difference between good and evil. And in that lack of knowledge that allows error to come in, and as a result, disrupt the unity of the body of Christ. When the Apostle Paul wrote his first letter to the church at Corinth, he was concerned about the lack of unity that existed within that congregation. And so in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 he wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He goes on to enumerate the contentions that existed among the brethren that brought about this lack of unity, verses 11 through 13. As he asked a series of rhetorical questions showing how ridiculous and damaging such divisions are. Again, our Lord recognized the importance of unity amongst those who would be his followers. But he didn't use the word unity, you noted. The word he uses there in his prayer in John 17 is the word one, a word that indicates a very close relationship. Notice if you would those words from John chapter 17 beginning at verse 17. Well, he, 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 he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me have I, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Clearly our Lord shows the oneness that should exist between brethren is like that between the Father and the Son. You want, one might ask, can you envision there being any division between the Father and the Son with respect to matters of doctrine? The answer must be a resounding no. And so there should be unity in matters of doctrine amongst those who are the children of God. And Jesus shows why that's vitally important when he says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Following the establishment of the church on Pentecost, following his death, burial, and resurrection, we find that those who are added to the church were of one accord, Acts 2, 41 and 46. Exhorting the, uh, the Ephesian brethren, Paul wrote to them concerning keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4, 3. Notice he said keeping the unity not bringing it about. And he goes on to show how that unity, that oneness is maintained as he speaks of the seven ones in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. 
Again, in writing to the church at Ephesus, he speaks of the unity of the church, the body of Christ, as he relates it to the human body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, showing the interdependence upon each part of the body. In writing to the Galatian brethren, he says that they become all one in Christ, Galatians 3, 28, whether they be Jew or Greek, bond or free. And he inspires on this thought as he writes to the church at Ephesus, showing that the Jew and Gentile become one in Christ, in the one body, the one church that our Lord purchased with his blood, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Peter similarly exhorts the brethren, 1 Peter 1, 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. To be of one mind is reminds us of Paul's words to the church at Corinth again in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. You all speak the same thing. You know, is it any wonder that the psalmist in the long ago, Psalm 133 and verse 1, wrote, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. <laughs> However, for the unity and the oneness that our Lord prayed for, that our apostles exhorted the brethren to maintain, and the early Christians sought to establish, for it to continue today, requires knowledge. Knowledge of the Word of God. And when such knowledge is lacking, it opens the door to false teachers to come in and destroy that unity. Such was the situation in the churches of Galatia, where some were so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ or to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Galatians 1, 6 and 7. Sadly, as a result, there were those who had fallen from grace and were back in the lost state. Galatians 5 and 4. Peter also speaks of false prophets and teachers that would privately bring in damnable heresies that would not only bring about their destruction, but also of those who would follow their pernicious ways. 2 Peter 2. John, in 2 John 9-11 through and Jude verse 4, gives similar warnings. But let us think about the matter of staying informed now. You know, in the New Testament times, they didn't have the written word, neither did they have the means available to us today for acquiring the knowledge of the truth and staying with form with regards to those who would seek to trouble the church. But that did not absolve the brethren from having the knowledge of the truth, nor from staying in form to be on guard for those who would seek to come in privily and draw away disciples after them. And when congregations and brethren do not stay informed about false teachers and false teaching, there can be and often are tragic results that disrupt the unity of the congregation or congregations as well as destroy that fellowship that should exist between brethren. I want us to go back in history now a little bit to show a point here. Back in the 1830s there was a British doctor that came to this country. While he was here he was obedient to the gospel and for some time very active in the work of the church particularly in the state of Virginia. He was known to Alexander Campbell and he wrote concerning this doctor, Dr. John Thomas. To proceed with the greatest brevity, I narrate as follows. Dr. Thomas called on Bethany on his way eastward. I think it was in the summer of 1832. He was recommended to me by the brethren in Cincinnati. While he sojourned for a few weeks with me, I formed a very favorable opinion of his devotion to the truth, his zeal and general talents. Insomuch that I strongly urged him to give himself to the study of the word in order to general usefulness, and gave him some directions as to the proper field he should occupy. He seemed to acquiesce with me and finally set out in pursuit of a favorable location. I advised him to go to Eastern Virginia, not as an editor, but as a physician and a preacher of the word, or to serve the brethren as they might choose. He went to Philadelphia. I saw him there in December 1833. The brethren in that city in general gave him a good character said that he improved in the knowledge of the scriptures, but was too self-opinionated and dogmatical. I apologized for his youth and inexperience and advised kind and courteous treatment of him, alleging that this infirmity would wear off in time. Now this is quoted to show that at one time, Campbell and Dr. John Thomas had been united in the faith, although Campbell indicated some character flaws in the doctrine. But by the time of writing his extra in the Millennial Harbinger at the end of 1837, there had arisen sufficient problems with Thomas and his teaching that Campbell thought it necessary to deal with these matters. And by the mid-1840s, matters had reached the point that when Thomas was 
pushing his false doctrine to the point that faithful brethren refused to fellowship him. In 1848, Dr. John Thomas decided to go back to England. After his arrival, there was some correspondence that placed in the British Millennial Harbinger in August of that year from the church in Nottingham. This has a report from the church at Nottingham indicating that they had not taken Dr. Thomas by the hand to support him as an evangelist, and nor had they recommended him to others. And the correspondence contained a letter of introduction they'd received from New York recommending Dr. Thomas, dated May 30th, 1848, a letter that was written to the church in July of 5th of 1848, following the receipt of the letter of recommendation the previous day, together with an article written by Thomas exposing some of this teaching. So they said, we got this letter, here's what letter we had responded with, and here's an article that shows his error. So the brethren could be aware, as much as possible. Later in that year, Thomas appeared as a delegate from the church in Lincoln at the meeting of the messengers of the churches that was held in Glasgow, Scotland, September 27 through 29. He was rejected as a delegate. This is what they stated. The delegate of the Lincoln church being a foreigner, some doubts were entertained as his being eligible to represent any congregation in Great Britain at this meeting. And some having said that he had made a declaration of non-fellowship with our brethren in the U.S., that they were prepared to prove it from his own writings. It was moved by Brother Wardropper and seconded by Brother Forsyth. That is, in the opinion of this meeting, that Dr. Thomas is not a fit person, fit and proper person to represent the church in Lincoln. Some discussion having taken place in the German was agreed to. This report was preceded by an article written by Thomas, in which he speaks about his break with Campbell and other brethren, with some comments by the editor of the British Millennial Harbinger, James Wallace. This is put forth here to show that evidence was available, to show that Thomas was no longer in fellowship because of his false teaching, both in the U.S. and in Great Britain. But Millennial Harbinger did get over to England, some, late, obviously, because of timing. Uh, not all of the churches would probably get the British Millennial Harbinger. But you know, even though there was some evidence available, Dr. Thomas was able to get into the British churches for about two years. And by the end of that time, he had split the British churches and established the Christadelphian movement. He took away about half of the congregations. And so, evidently, even though evidence was available, some brethren were vulnerable and uninformed, and he was able to creep in unawares, bringing in damnable heresies to draw away disciples after them. As we've indicated, some excuse could be given because of the circumstances and the times. Let's shoot forward about 140 years. This time it's the arrival of the evangelists in July of, 18, of 1982 from the Boston Church of Christ to establish the Central London Church of Christ. Prior to my moving to England in the summer of 1985, there'd been a meeting between some of the evangelists and other interested brethren in Wigan with those from the Central London Church. Of course, not being in the country, I wasn't able to go. But I got a tape recording of the, of the proceedings. Most of the discussion centered around the success that the Central London Church and the Boston churches were having in their methods of evangelism. But there was one evangelist there, Brother Jack Strachan, at the time who was standing strong for the truth, he did bring up about the error that had been propagated in the States and the division that was had eventuated. His questions were not well received by the evangelists from central London nor by the other British evangelists and most of those in attendance. Indeed, the British brethren in the main accepted what they were told by the evangelists from central London. Well, we're not Boston, we're the central London church. Yet they were fully supported by the Boston Church. The tapes that were made available were made available by the Central London Church, not by other brethren. Does that tell you kind of how the meeting went? The summer of 1986, after we had moved to Peter Burley, congregation that was established there hosted a lectureship program on the subject of evangelism with specific en emphasis on the Boston Crossroads movement. David Brown and other brethren were there. 
It was made clear in the advertising that was sent out to the churches that we would be discussing this. Most of the British evangelists did not even bother to attend, neither did they inform their members and encourage them to attend. Two or three years later, though, many of those same evangelists were complaining when central London was exposed in the media and no differentiation made between them and the congregations that had been established for many years in Britain. I was told by one of the producers of the program when I finally got in contact with him after the program had aired that he said he'd spoken to one British evangelist, Frank Wargan, who was at the time a preacher at Corby Church and an elder in the church there and a teacher in the British Bible School. He said that even after spending about an hour with him, Wargan had given him no information that would enable him to be able to show a different, differentiation between the two. And also, at this time, some of the British evangelists had gone to central London and were considered in fellowship by them and vice versa. At least one, Lloyd Mansfield, who was at the Cambridge Church at the time, sought to introduce some of the Boston teachings to the congregation at Cambridge. A little later on, after a split had occurred there, I had gone to work some with the South Cambridge congregation and was talking about the Boston Crossroads movement. And uh, I was informed, after I'd been teaching about this, the brethren now knew where some of these false doctrines were coming from that had been introduced by Lloyd Mansfield, the brothers as well, but that was one of the things. And see, in 1982, information was readily available, but it was ignored. It had been in papers over here that regularly got into Britain. It was in audios, video, VHS. There was lots of means of getting information over. Of course, by then we had airmail, not just Pony Express. And clearly, the evangelists and others chose to be willfully ignorant of what was happening. And even in 1986, when the lectureship was held in Britain, opportunity to be informed, they chose ignorance. But there was far less excuse in the mid-80s and early 80s than there was in the 1840s. The Boston movement again was able to creep in to bring in damnable heresies. Today we live in a different world where there can be no excuse of remaining uninformed, thanks to Al Gore and his internet. <laughs> you know, a few years ago, the same Frank Wargan that I'd mentioned earlier emailed the church where I was working at the time and made this statement. Once again, the old adage is proved accurate. A lie is halfway around the world before the truth catches up with it. Such is not true today as one is able to get information through the internet, sometimes instantaneously, streaming video. We're getting these lectures out right now. But as it relates to the contents of the email, he thought to say that I hadn't spoken truthfully with regard to the matters of central London that we mentioned above. But in response, I was able to provide information that showed his accusations were false. Through the internet and email, I was able to get a response to some of his false charges within about four hours of having received them. Six months later, he sent an email to a brother in England that he immediately forwarded it to me. This email was also filled with untruthful statements. In responding to his lies and false charges, I stated, Frank, it is wonderful that with modern communications, lies that you write about a brother to a third brother can reach him the same day in which they were written and the response be given. Truly, as you stated in your email of 111098, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth catches up with it. Well, your lie has gone halfway around the world and the truth is catching up with it and being returned to you the same day. You know, before the advent of email and the internet, it would have taken about two weeks for the exchange, even by, by airmail. Such is the power of the internet and email that both truth and error can be spread easily and rapidly around the world and is easily accessible. As we've already pointed out, this lectureship shows this. You know, the Lord's Church faces many dangers today from false teachers and from those who will lie in effort to protect themselves. But today it is relatively easy to get information and thus ascertain the truth. The very materials of false teachers, articles, sermons can be found on the internet. In some instances, the false teacher has placed his own teaching out there for all of us to see. In other cases, the information has been supplied by either scanning written material in, 
into the computer or having copies of audio and video files containing the information and then placed on a website. It's amazing what you can do, you know, in using Google search engines. For instance, I didn't have the British Millennial Harbinger in my possession, but I was able to go online and get the quotes that are in the manuscript concerning what the Nottingham Church did and concerning about the meeting in which Dr. Thomas was refused as a delegate. But you know, like many modern inventions, the Internet has both positive and negative attributes. For the Lord's Church and for his cause, it can provide a great opportunity to provide teaching that is freely available throughout the world, even a small congregation for a very modest investment of funds can have a website in which Bible teaching can be made available in various formats. It can be seen, read, and heard throughout the world. Wherever one has an internet connection, and one doesn't even have to have a computer that is wired, you can get wireless and still get anything. Your know, laptops can run on a battery and search the internet, send emails, chat, providing one has the connection, whether one's at home or on the road. And We've got brethren out here that can prove it right now. I see Lee's out there with his computer open. But why are many brethren still uninformed? Despite the availability, the ease of access of determining truth and error, why is it that many congregations and individuals remain uninformed? The reason is the attitude. We aren't concerned about that issue here. We're not bothered by that false teaching, and thus we don't have a problem in this congregation. Stopped and held by the elders and more also by the evangelists. They would rather hold to the devilish notion and develop the ostrich complex and bury their heads in the sand. This can have a devastating effect on the congregation and individual Christians when such issues arise in the congregation. And neither the elders, evangelists, or members are prepared to deal with it. We've seen the historical examples mentioned earlier. But also there is the woe is me complex that arises afterwards among those who chose to be uninformed. And also preachers have been told, don't preach on that here. We only want positive <coughs> sermons presented. Well, we don't want doctrine being preached here. We're fed up with doctrinal servants. The purpose of search is to silence the preacher from dealing with false teaching in order that brethren can be informed. Again, such leaves brethren vulnerable to the inroads of false teachers. But Jesus and the New Testament writers have been beholden to that philosophy. Much of the New Testament would not have been written. But Jesus and the New Testament writers knew the importance of brethren being informed in order to be able to combat error. And furthermore, the New Testament shows that it is appropriate to name false teachers and to call for them to be marked. Another aspect of this matter of being uninformed is so many of the publications that are produced among brethren don't want to get involved in issues. Recently, as we saw, what happened to an editor and an associate editor when they took a stand, and they're with us today. We know what that's all about. And yet the same magazine had published an article with the approval of the board earlier concerning a false teacher. But when it came down to it, they didn't want to take a stand. And the magazine has gone since through a change of philosophy with its new co-editors, and the New England Improved Gospel Journal is not like the original one. You know, there's one publication that considers itself a newspaper, the so-called Christian the Chronicle. But it only wants to put out positive information. Now, in a recent editorial, uh, Lynn McMillan, a CEO, wrote a, a large a column in there about uh, their desires on this. I won't take the time to read it because our time is getting short. It's in the manuscript, but I want to just look at a few quick quotes. He wrote, first, the purpose of this newspaper's editorial coverage, news stories, features, opinions, and reviews, is to inform, inspire, and unite churches of Christ around the globe. Get a look at the pages of the newspaper. Over the past few years reveals that they consider all manner of liberal congregations and works worthy of mention without regard to their adherence to biblical doctrine. Yes, they inform, but only with the respect to positive matters, preferring to ignore any error that may be propagated and practiced. How can error inspire and unite churches of Christ? In reality, it serves to promote and uphold the error rather than to oppose it. When error is exposed, it helps to inform, it helps to inspire brethren to be faithful, 
It helps brethren to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4 and 3. Again, Macmillan writes, the advertising policy of the Christian Chronicle as determined by the chief executive officer, i.e. himself, is to accept ads that publicize Christian services, ministries, events, and products that we deem to be of general interest to our readers. Examining what is generally appears in the advertising and realizing that as CEO he has banned any advertising that advocates various doctrinal stances, as he made in that statement, it's clear that he has determined that only those Christian services, ministries, events, and products that do not promote sound doctrine are what he as CEO deems to be of general interest to the to our readers. Such a stand speaks volumes as to what Macmillan himself believes and teaches. He continues stating additionally, ads must have a must clearly have a positive, harmonious Christian spirit. I wonder if they would accept a, an advertisement from the Rodriguez brothers. What the Carnical regards as positive and harmonious is often contrary to the teaching of Scripture. He continues, The Chronicle exists to strengthen God's people and to see that they are informed about individuals and activities that connect uh, to promote constructive dialogue. Well, considering the amount of coverage that they give to error and false teachers, it's clear that the paper desires its readers to be informed about false teachers, what they do, rather than exposing their error. He writes about the difficulty of maintaining balance. Yes, haven't we heard that before recently? Being balanced. But it's not just coming from the Christian Chronicle. It's coming from some of those who a few years ago were willing to take a stand for the truth, but because of a certain false teacher and because of money, they're more concerned with being balanced than they're holding the truth. But yet, the paper over the past years, the Christian Chronicle, has lost its balance a long time ago. And we've got some others that are losing theirs. The editor of an online paper sent an email to a list I am on back in November. I went to the website and looked at some of the stories. One was an article about the Gospel Broadcasting Network. A report there from giant Chad Dollarhide of said organization. And it's programming on the satellite networks. There was a place for comments. So I put a comment in, in, in that indicated that brethren need to find out whether support of GBN is good stewardship. And if you want to know all about that, read the last two issues of Contending for the Faith. I have articles with documentation in there, both in terms of finances as well as their fellowship practices. Almost immediately I received an email back from J. Randall Matheny, the editing of that online magazine, that said, your comment about GBN has been deleted. Since the news site is not the place for this type of criticism, an email to the editor would have been more appropriate. In other words, keep it away from the brethren. Don't let the brethren know. I responded immediately, respectfully, respectfully, Randall, it appears that such should be included in order that brethren can check for themselves the whole picture rather than a one-sided report. It does no good to just paint a rosy picture when everything in the garden is not rosy. Brethren need to be informed. And by your actions, you indicate that such is not important and only allows error to grow. Clearly, to have written to the editor would have shown, you know, nothing. It appears that Randall wants to be a Christian Chronicle wannabe. Let, brethren, let's not hold back on teaching the truth. Let's not hold back on exposing error. Let us use every means we have at our disposal in order to stay informed and to preach and to teach that brethren might be informed so that they don't become entangled with false teachers and false teachings because of lack of knowledge. All oh, some are going to go anyway. But let them not have the excuse they didn't know. Such does not mean that preachers need to spend all of their time exposing error. You know, that's true. It's one of, those, one of those things. Yes, we've got to deal with that. But brethren, if brethren are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, we've got to preach the truth. 
Yes, we've got to expose error. But let's build them up, but keep them informed when necessary. The truth needs to be taught so that they'll be able, the brethren will be better equipped to stand against them. But if they are also informed with respect to false teachers and their teaching, they will recognize it when it's, and present it and hopefully be able to expose it. Brethren, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. We need to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We should never sheathe the sword of the Spirit. And we should never give up the battle. The souls are at stake. Brethren, thank you. How was my time? You did it almost perfectly. You were left with 44 seconds left.